Hello, how are you all doing? Welcome to this episode of Fantasy First Aid. My name is Charlie. I am a non-binary sci-fi fantasy writer. And today we're going to be talking about 
building realism into the unreal and how that probably doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. But before we get into that, let me introduce you to the wonderful people that are here with me. I am joined by the wonderful Carrie H. Arthur and eventually by Cat Leo and maybe Alora. Hi! <laughs> uh, Roy is up in my lap. We'll see if his snoot boops the uh, touch screen of the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this could be fun. So, today has been a weird and interesting day for me. I am going to do my best to get through this and help you all out, but I am working on my final paper for the class that I'm in, and it has decided to eat up all of my CPU cycles in a way that I didn't really expect it to. Um... I mean, that's not really a lie. It's just more I didn't think it was going to be this uh, brain consuming. So, yeah, I'm a little toasty. How's everybody else doing today? Been busy. I recorded a video today that'll be out on Friday because um, I'm revealing a cover image. Ooh. Nice. That somebody helped me make because they're awesome. I have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> I got illustrations for in between my stories in my collection. They look pretty snazzy. Um, yeah, so I inserted those to see how much it expended my document. Not by much, so. Oh my gosh, it's 254 pages worth of short stories and micro-fictions and flashes. That, that's quite a bit. 51 and a half K. <sighs> Roy. I cannot wait to get back into drafting again, but I don't know when that's going to be because after, see, tomorrow is the last class in session in this class and then i think we have a two-week break before the next one starts so i'm hoping my brain will be doing okay enough that i can take advantage of those two weeks but then again i have not seen the full syllabus for the next class so i don't know how many books i'm gonna have to read for that one so I, i've come to accept i'm gonna be a little bit slow in my drafting right now but it's fine. It's fine. It's for a cause that I really want to be working towards. So on that note, I'm going to say hello to Cool Gamer and to the eventual CB. And yes, we started with the dance party because just in the theme of today, my back decided to start acting up like right when it was time to go live. And it's like, I need to do some pain mitigation before this. Why not dance party? Um, <laughs> stretch those muscles yeah because uh, I'm just I'm a bundle of wonderful right now <laughs> so bringing realism to the unreal I wanted to bring this up because I've seen some people discussing this over the years and they always miss what for me is the most important thing about fiction with a very few ex exceptions to this. Nobody wants your fiction to be realistic. Nobody wants your f fiction to be realistic. If you are writing the most mundane of slice of life, literary fiction, no one wants that to be realistic because realism would include all of the boring things like, and the ums and the ahs and the uh in the dialogue. And the brushing of the teeth and the details on every meal that every character has. And every time they change their clothes or take a shower or all of those things, that is realism. And while, yes, you might include some of that stuff for dramatic reasons or character building reasons, it's not what people want to read. Nobody wants an ordinary, realistic main character. If your character were real and ordinary, there'd be no point in telling this story about them. 
the story that you're telling is this character's most interesting thing that has ever happened to them. Generally speaking, something so interesting, it would probably never, ever, ever, ever happen to a human being in real life. Well, let, let's be quite real and quite honest about this. And this is particularly true in the romance genre. Like, as somebody who has had a very good romantic relationship for a very long time, our, 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 our origin story is not a romance novel in any way, shape, or form. And very few people have those beats that go into a romance story. So just bear that in mind when we're getting in, into this. Realism is very much in the eye of the beholder. And hello, Spence. And yes. Yes. <laughs> and I love that you said that because that brings us to our very first topic in here because I almost didn't include this on the list. In my first draft of the list of things I wanted to talk about, I left this one off because it is the one thing that everybody talks about when discussing this. And that is consistency, having internal consistency. This is what more than anything else will make your world and your story feel realistic. But you have to be very careful with this. And that's why you see, I added this thing at the end, trick your readers, don't lie to them. If, and I'm not going to name names because I don't believe in shaming other writers, but if the end of your story is very much a wizard did it. Don't spend the first 80% of the book proving to me that magic does not exist in this setting. Because when I get to the end of your book and a wizard did it, consistency broken. Consistency very broken. I, I, I cannot... I, no, you lied to me. You you proved to me that this is not a possible solution. I ruled it out as a solution. And I feel that this particular author felt that they were being clever. I feel like the promise of the premise of that story would have been a lie. Yeah. It, it felt like they thought they were being clever because now the ending is a surprise ending. That's not how surprise endings work. When, when you're building up your internal consistency, there are a lot of ways to do this. One is through proper and rigorous world building, which if you want more information about that, you can see previous videos on the channel or my podcast, uh, Mythic um, Myth Weaving, where I talk about that in great detail. But it's more making everything work with itself. The reason Avatar feels like a world that we can live in and that still exists in our brain. And by that, I mean the last airbender, not the James Cameron thing. <laughs> um, the reason that world feels right is because of its basic consistency. We feel it from episode one, when we're introduced to bending and how bending works is how at the end of book three, how bending works. <laughs> We didn't change anything along the way. There is a root consistency that works through this where we see how the uh, temperament of the bender works into their ab abilities to actually control the elements. And we see this with uh, both Zuko's inability to control his fire and how it gets away from him early on in the story and how it is really, really hard for Aang to learn how to make fire later in the story. That consistency of character really holds the story together. We see it in how Kintara and Aang are able to grow and develop at different rates. Aang is not better at world building because he is magic avatar man. Aang at water bending. I'm oh, sorry, water bending. Thank you. Yeah. Um, he's better at water bending because he already has some of the principles down because they are also a part of air bending. This idea of being able to go with the flow, to be able to get into the, into the motion of it and just kind of let go and ride the wave, which is so integral to waterbending, that's also a part of airbending. So 
he already has that down. Whereas Katara is still got a, that sense of controlling <laughs> everything that makes it harder for her to do it. So it's actually a personality thing, not a magical, well, he be Avatar, ergo he just better. It actually works into the setting, into the way that the characters are actually developed. And really, really helps make the story feel real. Hello, Maggie, how are you doing today? Ooh. I feel I'm, like... I'm nervous well, about that too. Anyway, continue. With Full Metal Alchemist, um, there is this quote unquote hard magic system where it's science to do alchemy, but there is this magical object thing called a philosopher's stone that can like negate the laws that you have to do it. And it doesn't come in as a, uh, well, deus ex machina. Now you can fix everything. It's introduced near the beginning. Like they, they want it to fix what they've done. And so it feels like it's part of the world and not just a cop out. And so I liked that consistency of, we know what the stone can do kind of like we know the theory. And so um, when it comes into play, it's not gonna, I don't know, do something that we hadn't already heard that it could do before. Cause the and, philosopher's stone also is basically a prepaid alchemy. Yes. And that, that makes it work so well in the story because the whole point of it is there is this cost to, to doing alchemy in that setting. And then you have this magic stone that makes everything magically work with seemingly no cost. And then you find out what it takes to actually make a philosopher's stone. And you're like, Oh, well, you, you just prepaid the cost. Exactly. So painful to find out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that, that really helps sell the idea when you get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to dive into my nerdiness, I love reading crossover fanfics where it's Harry Potter meets Full Metal Alchemist. And so these authors bring in the consistency of you must pay to do magic-esque things like alchemy. And so they'll come up with things like, well, the wand, you're using up your wand's core every time you do a spell. And that's the, that's the uh, payoff or different things like that, that they come up with to make it consistent so that the both worlds can mesh. Like, I thought that was really cool. And that is an interesting trade-off. And also just since you brought up Harry Potter, this is to me the biggest consistency break in the series and makes it really hard, especially when I get to book seven in that series where it is not explained to us earlier on that Molly Weasley isn't just waving her wand and having food magically appear. We don't understand that at all. It just feels like she's waving her wand and food. Uh huh. And we get this sense throughout most of the book that this is how magic can happen. So when Hermione can't do this and Ron is one of the characters that we are given to be kind of surprised by this fact. Highlighting that his mom just waved her wand and food appeared. <laughs> Reminding us of the inconsistency in the story. It feels like this is a constraint put on magic for sake of plot. Whether or not she considered this all the way through or not, right? In the back of her mind, she may have already been thinking that Molly was just teleporting food from the refrigerator in, onto the tables magically cooked or whatever, right? She may have been thinking about that, but she never conveyed that to us, the reader. And it starts getting to me a little strange that what, how, what is the distance rating then for this magical teleportation of the food? Because could you not just set up camp close enough to a grocery store and then magically teleport the food? Like, I, how, or is the food in like a pocket dimension and you just pull it out? Like, I, because this is a sudden addition to the world, whether again or not, whether or not again it was an addition or not, it feels like it is because, with the exception of seeing them go to the house elves to get food, 
the idea that food was prepared by anything other than the waving of a wand to make magic feels strange. It feels weird. And we have the perfect way to introduce this into the story through the Weasley twins, because the Weasley twins are making all manner of confectionaries that have magical properties to them. If we would have spent just a wee bit of time where Harry is talking to them while they are making the various canary creams and what have you, right? We could have seen, oh, that's how the magic works. They had to have these certain ingredients that they are then enchanting together into blah, 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 blah. Oh. They were with the cauldrons in their bedroom. That's... Cauldrons can be used for a lot of things. <laughs> we just find out that they have cauldrons in their bedrooms and there are explosions. Yeah. We don't see them with raw ingredients. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They could have been... We don't know whether they're transmuting these things, whether they are, like their mother appears to be doing, magically whiveling them into existence or not. And that is a problem. Um, I believe uh, Harry Potter is actually older than Full Metal Alchemist. Because I think the... Because, let's see, the first Harry Potter book came out in what was it? 99. It was, so yeah, I was supposed yeah. to say the late 90s. And I don't think the first Full Metal Alchemist manga was until the early 2000s, I think. But the Philosopher's Stone isn't just from Harry Potter. It's yeah. it's an ancient The concept idea. of it is, is, yeah, hundreds if not thousands of years old. <coughs> yeah, it, it does a little bit. It, it, it does. It feels there, there's a strangeness about book seven in that series. And it's because of a lot of the, what feels like inconsistencies that I feel like could have been set up better in earlier books. And that that's really what we're talking about today is learning how to set these things up and learning from some of the missteps that have happened. So spoilers for season three of Star Trek Discovery. But the great mystery of the of that season is something happened in the deep, dark future that caused all of the magic fuel that the spaceships run on, dilithium, to suddenly explode, destroying any ship that was currently traveling faster than light. And causing everybody else to be afraid to use said fuel because it just decided to spontaneously combust throughout the galaxy and kill a lot of people how did that happen why did this happen so many questions right when we actually get to our answer and here's the actual spoiler from the episode if you want to skip ahead a little bit um i'll keep my hand up while i'm giving the spoiler if you want to mute if you don't want the spoiler uh we end up finding out there's a magic alien child who got really sad and they were part of a race that we had never established had telepathic powers, even though one of the main characters on the show was from that species. And he got very, very sad and his sadness resonated throughout the universe and made the dilithium blow up. <laughs> this is the dumbest answer to this. Not that it could not have been made meaningful. Right, we've already spent two seasons with a Kelpian in our, in our in our series. We could have introduced this connection to nature, this connection to subspace, this psionic ability. Any of these could have been set up in the previous two seasons. They were not, as far as we know. The only thing that's pointed out about them is in the mirror universe, Kelpians are consumed as food, and also in our universe, they were consumed as food by a weird evil race that has to be defeated at one point because i don't know discovery did things in the early seasons <laughs> but none of this is set up none of this is earned and so by the time we get to the revelation of baby got sad baby blew up half the universe what now well you did what now this is not consistent with anything that we have ever seen and star trek is not a set setting that is immune to immensely god powerful creatures we have everyone from charlie x to the uh, second pilot of the show where no man has gone before where mysterious space force field thing 
made one of the crew members into basically a god being with silver eyes because reasons. Um, so, I mean, the show has had weird, super powerful people before. We could have relied on some of that earlier lore to make this make sense in some way. Did we? No. And so that inconsistency stands out and just, right? Yeah. Right. It is. It is. It's the Q did it because I kept waiting for that answer because it, it would actually make more sense in this, in Star Trek to just be like, I don't know. Q was bored one day and went, you know, people really do travel way too much. Boom. Okay. Life's better now. Um, oh <laughs> universe is quieter. Like it would at least be consistent with the story. Right. But it's it's not. They didn't try to set it up. They didn't try to make it fit in. And by the time we get to the point where they're trying to backfill all of this lore into the setting, which is literally done in one episode, the episode where the reveal happens. And this is a serialized show, so it's not like they only had an episode to tell this story. <laughs> you had like nine episodes up to this point to tell this story. It feels unearned. This is actually what got Star Trek Discovery in trouble in the first place. It's first season's twist, which I think is an interesting twist and could have been a very interesting twist, is not set up at all. And it's so badly not set up that it alienated most of its audience before they got to the twist. Because you don't get to the twist again until like episode like 9, 10 of the series. And you get to the twist and you're like, oh, that's why I hated everything about the show up to this point. Oh, that's why Lorca is the most terrible creature ever. Oh, I understand now. But nothing prior to this point gives you any hints that you could use to figure it out. Nothing. It's kind of of like those mystery books where the culprit is the one person that didn't even have a name that showed up in that one scene in the background. Yep. It's like, there's no possible logical way for the reader to come up with the answer themselves. And this is the only reason why I feel like it is still even worth the time and effort and energy to be like, please be internally consistent in your story. If you want your story to feel real, this is the biggest problem with the, uh, uh, Star, Star Wars sequel movies, for example, they lack this sense of internal consistency. If we were supposed to know that pa- it was Palpatine all along, shouldn't there have been like, I don't know, a laugh in the first movie? Like, remember when Ray's having her big force vision and she hears mm-hmm. like Obi Wan and all the other characters talking in the force? We could have heard Palpatine laugh. Uh huh. And suddenly our brain starts going, oh crap. Why did I hear his? What? Why was he there? And that would have given us and given us a setup. Now the problem with that series is they did not know where it was going. And well, I take that back. I think they did know where it was going, and then they had to fire the director for for episode two, for their for the second part of it, the trilogy, and throw out his entire uh, work on it because he had a movie. Uh, he he did fan four stick. And they were like, oh, oh, no, we're not trusting you with a major tentpole in our, <laughs> no, that no. That movie had issues all on its own. Yeah. And they, they fired him because Josh Trank was supposed to do that one. I don't understand why they're like, we need to have a different director for every episode of this thing. Like, ah. <clears throat> Yeah, we that's a, that's a, we can do that episode. We can talk about that one, but I'm not going to get derailed <laughs> on that at this moment in time because oh, I have feelings. But yeah, this is this is what makes that feel inconsistent because J.J. Abrams in episode one in his fir- first part in The Force Awakens wanted to destroy Coruscant because he hates the prequel movies and wanted to destroy everything in the prequel movies. When you see all the planets get blown up. In his original script, that was Naboo and Coruscant that got blown up. And our story started on Tatooine. He wanted to truly just like completely redo the original (laughs) trilogy 
but with different space Nazis. Mm -hmm. Um, Disney wisely said no and created Hosnian prime and a couple other planets, Chandrilla and others that could, he could still blow up and make him happy. So he wouldn't throw a tantrum and the movie came out. Everybody complained. It's too much like the star Wars, star Wars of the past. It's just a nostalgia bomb. They brought in one of the most brilliant film directors that we have right now, Ryan Johnson. I, I will fight on this because I have seen like every movie he's ever made. He is so good and said, do something fresh, do something original. And he did. And he took the franchise in a very different way that could have been for, made for interesting storytelling. And then they brought JJ Abrams back because they had to get rid of the guy who was supposed to do three for other reasons. <laughs> And JJ uh, was like, no, I set up a story I wanted to tell. <laughs> which is why the th which is why the Rise of Skywalker basically retcons everything that happened in the first two movies to just because yeah, no, no. This is not how you do storytelling. This is not this is not how you do storytelling at all. Internal consistency matters. And this honestly is why the MCU works. And I'm saying this because I know a lot of people watch me who are pantsers because I am a pantser and talk a lot about pantsing fiction. The MCU is pantsed. They do not know what is going to be happening next. All continuity in the MCU is retroactively meaningful. There, look at the first movie in each series. A lot of Easter eggs are thrown in. A lot of them. Subsequent films pick up on what was successful and retroactively make things from earlier movies meaningful. And they continue this, continue this building going, okay, so we're going to take this one off line from this movie and this one off line from that movie. And we're going to mush them together with this other story that we're wanting to tell to make this feel like continuity. And that's why it works. Yes. It is a massive patchwork quilt. That is a great way to think about it. But it works. And it, by the time you get to Endgame, it feels like you've been watching, what, 10 years of movies leading up to this point. Like, how else could this have ended? This was not the plan. This wasn't a great master plan. It was very good pantsing along the way that connected and interconnected and saw how people were reacting to certain relationships and making it work and kept this internal consistency that got us to that point. Consistency is the king here. Yep. That's really the only true consistency that it has. And when people are like, so after Endgame, it felt a little scattered. Yes, because they're seeding a whole bunch of new Easter eggs that will retroactively feel meaningful. I haven't got to see Multiverse of Madness yet, but I, I may have watched quite a few spoiler reviews because I'm not averse to knowing spoilers. And uh, it sounds like a lot of the Easter eggs that were set up in WandaVision that people were like, but why are they? Were used in that film to make it really work. It's not necessary to have watched WandaVision to understand that, that movie, but it retroactively changes the meaning of things that happened in WandaVision to make the continuity feel real. And that's how a properly pantsed series works. It always has to reference the past and make it work going forward. This, I think, is secretly J.K. Rowling's success. I do not believe that she had all of the books planned out from the beginning. I do believe she may have had that la a version of that last chapter, but that last chapter doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you any of the things that they went through on the way to get there. That, that part may be true, but it builds off of what was successful in the previous books. It builds off of what was there, and it goes back and retroactively makes meaningful one-off things from previous books and makes them have meaning. Like the diadem in the whatchamacallit. Yep. Chamber in the, of in the room of requirement. Room of requirement. Thank you. It's like it's not chamber of requirement. What am I thinking? Like the vanishing cabinet that is a one off joke in book one. Mm hmm It is a brought up again as a joke in book two. 
and slowly gains significance until it brings about the death of one of the series' most beloved characters to that point. Mm -hmm. Was that planned out, or was that just retroactive consistency? If you pull off retroactive consistency well enough, no one will ever know. And that is the power of retroactive consistency. This is, by the way, why Star Trek is both as weird and as wonderful as it is. The writers are free to go back to previous iterations of Star Trek and pull out anything that they want to forward, which gives you a sense of continuity for that series. And they are also free to ignore anything that does not serve their story. Which is why some people get really sad when their favorite parts of the consistency are not pulled forward. But that's what has made th those series work as well as they have in the past. See, I'm wondering what, what happened to turn Love and Th Thunder from a 10-hour series into a two-hour movie. Um, the pandemic is would be my guess. Was it uh, supposed to be a series? Yes, Love and Thunder was originally supposed to be a series on uh, Disney+. Plus. My, th I think they're trying to speed up the current phase that we're in because there's basically two, a two year gap because movies were not being made and or not being released that if you look at a lot of the commentary around, for example, multiverse of madness, it's just like, finally, this movie's out. It feels like it's been, we've been talking about it forever. And yeah, because of the way movie cycles work, we were talking about it forever because production was postponed and then release was postponed. And then dot, 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 dot. That's <laughs> like, how I feel about the upcoming minions movie. <laughs> Like it, Atlanta, the new season of Atlanta, it was already pushed off a year because he wanted to work on other projects in between. And then the pandemic happened, which pushed it off the production even further. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are having a weird gap year experience with our media right now. And I think they're trying to speed things up. I think this is also why the future of Star Wars became uh, murky, because you have to remember we should have had three to four new Star Wars movies come out by now. And you're having one a year. Every Christmas. Not to mention the uh, other side stories that were supposed to be coming out along with. But none of those got to be made. So you have to completely redo your plan on how to go forward. And that, that's my personal theory on that one. Um, yeah. I, I am shocked at so many things that they could have done though i do kind of wish we could get a glimpse of the parallel universe version where uh was it kurt russell who was originally was one of the contenders for han solo just because i think that could have been an interesting han solo it'd be a very different han solo but that, there are a couple of, like alternate castings for things that have happened in the past that I wish we could just like glimpse uh, the parallel if, if universe. If she's saying that Tom Cruise would have been Iron Man, I wouldn't have watched it. Yeah, Tom Cruise was originally intended to be Iron Man. No, nope. wouldn't have watched and it. There's the whole Nicolas Cage Superman. <sighs> you know, I, I would like to say I wouldn't have watched that, but I will pretty much watch most things that have Nicolas Cage in them because it's going to be interesting. It may not be good, <laughs> but it will be interesting. Um, uh, I think that's possible. Yeah. I think, I think that that is very much a possibility. I think this also may, is the big problem that, uh, Game of Thrones is the, I'm sorry, the Song of Ice and Fire books is having right now is I think a lot more characters are supposed to die in the series, in the book series than did on the TV show. And also I think the TV, it's supposed to end in roughly the same place the TV show does. And seeing how people reacted to that has forced to rewrite also because Gurr has said that he has rewritten entire books because he saw on reddit somebody figure out a plot point but that means you're doing your job right so i'm just saying it's the kind of writer that he is bitch stay on reddit that's not your job he just doesn't like people knowing where his stories are going. Uh, I have so many feels. 
I, I'm just mm. don't give Jane Foster cancer unless you figured out a way to make that story work, which I don't know if there is one. But the Jane Foster Thor from the comics is terrible, and I don't like her. Um. <laughs> Of course I say interesting because it's Nick Cage is uh Nick Cage. I I, I don't <laughs> know. I mean it it is what it is. Alrighty, I was wanting to do some sprinty sprints on this stream because I have a lot of things to be working on. So I think we've gotten a good ways in on this topic. Let's go ahead and pull up a timer real quick. I'm not going to do like super long sprints, but enough to like clear the head, get some stuff done. So I'm going to do a little bit longer than that. I know I haven't put the timer up yet. It's a pretty, pretty princess timer. You know which one it is. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Alrighty. Number one. So, if we're going to get into other more interesting ways to make your stories real when we come back from the sprint. I just really wanted to get this one out of the way because I know what comment sections look like when you don't say the most obvious thing. <laughs> and I think we had a really good conversation about it as we were doing. Uh, yay for thunderstorms. We're supposed to be having thunderstorms right now, actually, and it's bright and sunshiny outside, and I don't know what's going on. So one of the first things I'm going to be doing is checking the weather, because... Did it get pushed off to tomorrow? Is it later tonight? Did it just decide, eh, no. I, inquiring minds want to know. Um, I'm going to pick number four. I think I'm going to pick number five because, again, I want that hair. I would look fierce with purple hair. <laughs> All righty. Make sure that you have something to hydrate with. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. If you don't have anything to work on and you just want to veg out for a little bit, that is perfectly okay. If you need permission to daydream, consider this your permission to daydream. We're going to get started on the sprint in five, four, three, two, one, and go. Let's go catch ourselves some unicorns.
Number three. Number three caught a unicorn. If you had number three, you are a winner. And if you did not have number three, you're still a winner in my book. But it looks like Maggie wins. Yay! So I... Uh, I look at the housing market and I want to cry. I, I have made a list of what seem to be acceptable short-term personal and professional goals and am working on long-term strategic goals. <laughs> Can you see happiness on face? So much. So much with the happy. Oh, this, no. house, this house that I found that is under a million dollars sold in 2014 for half the price it's listed at now. Less than half the price. It's like, ugh. Uh, Every, I cannot find a single house that's actually a house under half a million in any of the cities surrounding Toronto. Not even in Toronto, where a million will get you an apartment. Mm. Hello, Jules. I don't remember saying hello to you earlier. Looking at all the candidates' platforms for your primary election. Uh, yeah. <sighs> I feel like this is going to be increasingly true until we can, I don't know, turn some kind of a corner where facts matter again. But uh, this election, more than any of the other elections, is very important. If you live in the continental United States or even in Alaska or Hawaii, make sure to check out the people that are running and do vote because something. <laughs> ah. I know that feeling. I also was doing pain mitigation because I fell asleep in a very bad position last night and uh, pinched a nerve in my shoulder. Oof. Which I do a lot. And so I am trying to get it to uh, be better. So if you see any weird uh, these kinds of motions, eh, that's what's going on. I'm trying to trying to undo undo what I did. It's fun. Alrighty, where were we? Oh yeah. Apparently, I need to feed Roy, so I'll be back. Well, talking about bringing the realism to the unreal of our fiction, we have already talked about bringing in some internal consistency and how we need to trick our readers with red herrings and the like, and not uh, just boldface lie to them. So number two, in what I like to call internal mundanity, uh, you get to define what's ordinary in your world. And this is a very important thing that can really make or break your story. If your characters are reacting to every magical thing that happens with a, with a oh my goodness, wow! Um, magic is apparently rare in your setting, or they would kind of just be like, ah, you did a thing. I mean, it's it really is that simple. And your readers will very often go along with whatever it is that you are treating as mundane and ordinary. This is actually why some superhero movies work better than others. And one of the main reasons why Marvel superhero movies work better than DC superhero movies, because Marvel just goes, they're superheroes. Huh. Okay. And moves on with life. Whereas I feel like the DC movies spend the first like half of each of their movies going, superheroes what and then going oh crap we need a story too right um thing happens skybeam done um, and, and it just it, it it 
it breaks the illusion. It takes you out. It keeps you from being able to actually experience the story that is being told. Oh, that's not good. Stay safe, Maggie. Stay safe. Um, oh, and I did check our weather. It's going to be uh, tomorrow. It got moved off. It got slow. So, yeah, keep, keep yourself safe. Keep an eye out. Hopefully everything will be fine. And I forgot to mention that CB got 154 words on our on that sprint. So, yay. And, oh, I need to stop trying. I need to simultaneously be raising my arm more so that it will pop back into place right. And also not raising my arm because it hurts every time I do it. Um, <laughs> oh, I got my chicken and dumplings, by the way. It's the broth because it's one of its main ingredients is turmeric and turmeric root. So it's got a very strong turmeric like smell and taste. Um, but cooking it with like the chicken in it um, and the dumplings that I made that are very dense because I don't follow anything. And was like, let's just throw this in here and this in here. And oh, look, the kitchen sink's in here now, too. Um, with the dumplings, so they're very dense. And um, sad news, though, my I am having some of my pain. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, because I did eat some of the chicken beforehand, so I'm wondering if my body is just like, you ate something. Pain. So that's kind of why I'm like a little curled up in my seat right now. Because mm -hmm. I'm getting the twinchies. And I was like, I'm just going to pause my eating and nibble a little at a time. Yeah. That's what I did on the break, by the way. I have returned. Welcome back. So, yeah, I would agree that the uh, Dark Knight trilogy did not do this, though. My biggest beef with the Dark Knight trilogy actually isn't about the uh, consistency or anything like that. It's more that it didn't know when its movies should end. I feel like it was more five movies wrapped into three movies that, especially the second one, feels really long because the movie ends. And then it's just like, no, we still have a whole other film's worth of story to tell you. And it's like, oh, okay. And they saved the least interesting of the stories for the one that gets ended last. And uh, not that I have anything against Harvey Dent, but I mean, you had both Harvey Dent and Heath Ledger's Joker, and the one I cared about is no longer here. So why are your movie still moving? And that is very true. There's a lot we could talk about with uh, mental health and uh, superheroes because, oh, oh my goodness. They all need therapy, but not the therapist that they gave them. Yeah. Yeah. So when you are telling your story, you need to be very clear about what is special with your story. What would characters react to? What would they not react to? What would they find to be just completely normal and going back to the various star trek series this is something that they have done both very very well and uh really really problematically <laughs> over the years in that you know i i still find it rather jarring when i watch that tng episode where they're like they uh, actually they've done it in several of the series because there's one in tng there's one in Deep Space Nine, and there's one in Enterprise where they're like, they have more than one gender? What? And I'm just like, the the Bible has six genders in it. Um, not not new. Um, uh. So, you know, be careful not to uh, date yourself too badly with that as well. Hello, Nia. How are you doing? But I think this one is fairly self-explanatory. I don't think I need to belabor this point all that much. Just be very careful when you're picking what everybody considers normal. <sighs> also, on the no 
normal thing, wouldn't it? Like, so, like in my books, there's the supernatural community and the main character, like supernatural is normal for her, but then there are people who have no idea. So if they saw it, it would be, what the hell? Mm -hmm. But like, if Ravinia saw, like, saw the plants just start going, she'd like, where's my brother at? Where's the fucker? So just to go back over to the Harry Potter example, it's perfectly fine for Harry to be amazed by everything that he sees because he did not come from a magical world. Uh, it's, it's not surprising that he is shocked by everything that he sees there. And this is highlighted specifically in the film version of the first mo of the, the, of the first movie where they're arriving at Hogwarts and like oh, the pictures are moving. Why, why would all of the kids be surprised by this? Because the newspapers move all, all of them, the magical pictures move. That's mm -hmm. a function of the setting. The, unless we're just to assume every voice that we heard when they're like, oh, the portraits are moving. Like, unless those were all the Muggleborns speaking. And there were a lot more Muggleborns in that year than we knew about. They shouldn't have been having that reaction. Mm -hmm. Because that should be normal. Like I said, the, the newspaper, the pictures move. So everyone should have just been like, eh. they may have been more excited about, oh, that's a picture of this person or that person or that. Oh my goodness. That's the portrait that I saw the, that's so famous or whatever, you know? Yeah. And kind of going off what Kat was saying where different things are normal to different people in my plot bunny story. Um, there are different magic users that have different specialties. And so my main character like um, encounters somebody shape-shifting for the first time. And that's like, and she's like, you could do that? <laughs> yeah, or um, again with mine, because there are so many different supernatural beings. So like, it is possible that my main character could just be like, what is it? They're real? I thought they were a man. Mm -hmm. Because or something like that. Any, anything that is treated as mundane is ordinary. And so that that's really the point to bring home there. Uh, one of the things I love about the early episodes of Enterprise is how they are all just kind of freaking out about warp travel because, well, this isn't the first warp ship that any of them have ever served on. This is the fastest one and the furthest any of them have ever gotten. So they're constantly like, did the deck, deck plates just move? Like, <laughs> well, what was that vibration? And that makes sense because they are new to the, new to this type of travel. They are amazed by what's going on and it, 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 it works. It also works in a way in uh, the force awakens when they're like, wait, all of these people are real. They're not myths that were made up. Like when she meets on solo for the first time and realizes those weren't just stories. And you can use that to great effect throughout the <laughs> The first time when 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 she, when Ray calls the Millennium Falcon a hunk of junk, I was sitting in the theater watching that scene with a friend of mine, and she's like, and when we realize what they're talking about, my friend goes, Blasphemy! <laughs> I'm like, Jen, calm down. <laughs> And I also, Maggie, love how this got built out into uh, uh, in Lower Decks, where they decided to elaborate on this, and because they couldn't get the rights to Pern, according to the official canon that is Lower Decks, there's an entire cosplay planet where they basically found dragons on it, and then decided to set up their own medieval empires, where there are turkey legs for all, and everyone is a lord or a lady, and they're basically LARPing their best lives on this planet because there be dragons. I want and to go through there. It cracks me up so much because they end up having to go over to one of the ships. And while they're there, they're like, they have wonderful medievalized terms for everything. 
Like it's not the warp drive. It is the dragon breath simulator. And just, it's so, it's so good. I, I, I just, all the love. I, know I even have here. clothing for it. I want to yes. go to there. <laughs> but because there is so I know, but... <laughs> It is a wonderful subplot on Lower Decks that I absolutely fell in love with because we end up finding out that one of our crew members is the secret prince from this co- from this like cosplay world, and oh, I love it so much. Yes, and them being nervous using transporters. Again, because they're new and they're not used to them. This, for me, is one of the things that gets really weird in Discovery because to get rid of all of the complaining about that show, they decided to jump 900 years into the future so that they were beyond all Star Trek continuity (laughs) to tell stories. And they're introduced to all of this like fabulous, amazing new technology. And they're all just like, Huh. Okay. And like none of them are like freaking out at like programmable matter. Like I love the idea of programmable matter that they brought into Star Trek Discovery. It is a very fun thing. And the fact that nobody is just sitting there geeking out about it. The fact that Jet Reno, we don't get a scene of Jet Reno just sitting there with, with a pad and some programmable matter going cup, not a cup. Ship, not a ship. Just just making it turn into different things and giggling is a failure of the series because Jet Reno would totally do that. And if you don't know, Jet Reno is played by Tig Notaro on the show. And yes, Jet would do that. And it should have happened because that would have been different and strange and <sighs> so much. Yeah, right? Right? Maybe we will finally get our Pern series. I say not really meaning it because I know it'll never happen. Alrighty, so. uh, Topic number three. Fear breaks the spell. And this goes with what we were talking about earlier. If you are reticent to put something in your story, it will come through. Hi, Joe in your fiction. Be very careful when you're world building. If you are not confident about the thing, your readers will feel that. If you feel that you need to understand how hyperspace might work, go get a copy of Michio Kako's book, uh, hyperspace and sit back and go, wow, even like physicists don't understand this. Okay. I'm fine. Uh (laughs) Because, you know, I, I was that person. That, that, that was me. I, I wanted to make sure I had the science right because I got tired of all the notes and then realized no one has it right. So I can do what I want. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Check your fear when you're writing. You can feel that reticence in writers when you're reading them. And when I say fear, it's fear that no one will like the story and also fear that no one will believe the story or buy into the story. There are so many books that I have read that the narrator basically becomes an insipid, nervous giggler because the author does not believe that the reader will suspend their disbelief and go along on the road with them. And so the narrator of the story is all like, (laughs) isn't it crazy? Make sure that anytime that phrase appears in one of your books, it's earned because I'm not saying again, I'm not here to shame other writers publicly yet, but I may have read a book not that long ago that the narrator started most of the info dumps with, isn't it crazy that info dump? No, it isn't. Um, this is the world. It isn't. So I'm, I might have this slight, this problem a little bit just because I'm like, I don't want to, like, it's not that I'm not confident in the information I want, but it's, I'm not confident in like, I don't want to info dump, but I needed to info dump. 
if that makes sense. Like for the story, I needed to info dump, and I'm like, but I don't want to info dump. <sighs> but I needed to because Lavinia, um, at the very beginning of Shadow, Lavinia is in training, and she's actually sitting in classes and being taught about other supernatural beings. So it's like an info, like she's in classes, she's like, wait, what? You're telling me that this subsection and this subsection are all the same, but this one and this one are not? But they're all shifting. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I am adding to the list of future topics how to info dump properly. Thank you. Because. Same oh, cat. That is, uh, that, that is a whole topic and a half. Uh, a, lo a lot of this comes down to just the boldness with which you say it and having a good uh, narration voice for it. One of the things that I love so much about... Um, okay, Brain. Brain, give me his name back. Ring World. <laughs> The Hogfather. This is going to drive me crazy. Jerry Pratchett? Jerry Pratchett. Thank you. Literally, his name was right there. I went to say it, and literally, it was like I saw a hand come in and go, whoop, and pull it right out of my brain. And, ugh. No, I, I, I'm well rested. It's fine. Um, oh, Larry Nevin did this too, but Terry Pratchett did this so well in that his narrator's have a voice that I just want to hear them talk. And I forget which book it's in, but in one of the books, he, the narrator is basically a drunken city guard who spends a lot of his chapter basically gossiping about everybody in this drunken slur and broken sentences because he keeps falling asleep because is drunk. And it's one of the most delightful things to read. And it's just an info dump. It's so that you understand all of the characters we're going to meet later in the story. And it's just this drunk guard just talking about all the people in the world. And it's, but it's written, written so well. Oh no. Stay safe, Maggie. It's written so well that one, you can see his confidence coming through. And because the mm, he keeps losing his train of thought, kind of like I am right now, and then coming back to it later, you find yourself like fascinating, like trying to piece together the web of the story that he's telling you because he gets distracted because ooh shiny. Just like <laughs> the keys in his pocket make a sound and he gets lost for a second and he's just like oh yeah are all the do doors closed did i did i did i lock all of this up i don't know this seems like a good place to take a nap though and he's just so like mm. Narr narrator voice is such a powerful technique to do info dumps that it can really help you out uh it's also Terry Pratchett, but with Neil Gaiman in there. Neil Gaiman is very good at this too, but so much of the opening of a chapter or the middle of a chapter in Good Omens is an info dump. Okay. So Good Omens, I literally cannot get past like the hospital scene. <laughs> because I get to there, I have to reread it every time because it takes so long because I'm just dying laughing. The whole time like physically reading the book i cannot actually read the book like it's why i got the audiobook because i'm like maybe this might be the only way i'm gonna be able to actually read this book. oh yeah you just can't stop it's you just can't funny. you just can't stop and uh i don't know which audiobook you have but for anybody who does not know the cast of the netflix series did an a full cast version of the audiobook Neil Gaiman is the narrator and all of the characters that appear in the show, the actors reprise their parts for the book, for the audiobook. I know there's a version where David Tennant reads it. 
No, they did a full cast. Oh. They they just I, I have it. I've been listening to it on repeat because I need happiness I in my life. Narrated by Martin Jarvis. Looks like. That's a good one too. I've I've got that one as well. But I'm wondering if that one's an audible exclusive because it's the Prime Series cast. Mm-hmm. That one might be. Here, let me... Actually, no. I also have one. I have two copies of it. Hold on. <laughs> this one is the f- yeah. I also have the full cast production one. The full cast is so good, and I mean anything with David Tennant is so good. Mm. I'm so excited he's coming back next year on the Doctor Who. <laughs> I want I want to be excited. I want to be excited. We, we've talked about my issues, and they have nothing to do with Doctor Who. They have everything to do with answering the one question of who get, who get the money. Because I have problems with the BBC. Lots of problems with the BBC right now. <sighs> Which I think are understandable problems. Okay, let's see. CB says, kind of noped out of fa- fantasy books after the the Hunger Games. It was such a freaking letdown. Um, That's a dystopia. So, f- fantasy is a very broad genre, and I would just say, if a particular subgenre of fantasy is not to your liking, others may be. I am a huge, huge fan of all of the uh, sword and sandal fiction. I really like that a lot. Um, I write a lot of sword and planet fiction because that is where my heart is. There's a lot of, uh, I actually prefer sword and sorcery to epic fantasy. And the basic difference between the two simply put is the stakes in uh, sword and sorcery. They're not necessarily trying to save the universe every time because that gets tiresome. Um, what about overtime? <laughs> sometimes overtime, but a lot of a lot, a lot like of the a uh, series, a lot of, uh, and they don't realize they're doing it. That would be hilarious. Most of the sword no, she doesn't realize she's doing it. Most of the sword and sorcery books that I've read are just basically the madcap adventures of fill in the blank. And yes, yes, please. All of that. Because I, I, oh, we're going to go see what's over that mountain range over there. Oh, you heard there be dragons over there. Let's go. That's <laughs> kind of what I'm going for with my Plot Bunny series. <laughs> I, I am a huge fan. Huge, huge, huge fan. Um, see, looking at time, I think we have time to get into the fourth one, but we may do a sprint in the middle of it. Ah. <sighs> Learning to boil our poor, poor frogs. First of all, because somebody will definitely comment this in the comments. No, putting a frog in boil in slow in cold water and slowly increasing the temperature will not trick it into not jumping out of the pot. That that is that is not 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 really a thing. And I hate that people have tested this. People be better. Um, it is a metaphor. Of when things change slowly around you, you don't notice it. And uh, this is how good stories should work. This is this is one a thing that will help you uh, avoid power creep. Because if you are being very careful and building towards the powers that your characters are going to have, the mystery cough, cough, Dragon Ball, Ball Z cough. Oh. God. <laughs> that could have startled. Oh, that, that just, yes, yes. All the Dragon Ball Z. I'm listening to Charlie, listening to Charlie, and all of a sudden, Laura Force. <laughs> all the Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z is so bad at the power creep. And it's because they don't do this. They just, oh, there are no frogs being boiled in that series at all. At all. It's just, it, it's kind of uh, um, the playlist from How I Met Your Mother, all rising. Just all rising all the time. So how do you do the how do you do this? If you're a pantser or a plotter, it's a lot easier if you're a plotter. I will state that for the record as somebody who is who is a pantser and knows plotters very very well and has tried this in the past. 
you need to have an idea of where your story is going so that you can build up naturally to it. My uh, Whispers in the Dark series, which I hope to one day actually put out into the world to read, though I need to raise the money to get uh, some developmental editors in on it. Um, the story starts fairly simple and becomes more and more complex as we are delving more and more and more into the magic of this world and into these characters. And by the time we get to book three, where it's just sheer insanity, hopefully, if I did my job right, you are feeling the power creep along with it, that the powers that we come into contact with in the final book make sense to you mainly because the book series is basically about three gods being petty with each other. And by book three, they've decided proxies aren't working anymore. We're just going to be petty. <laughs> so like the power creep is like, Oh no, we have to fight literal gods. Now we're all dead. <laughs> My favorite chapter of the book is titled. We're all dead. Um, Three, three gods of death warring over a planet. We have to stop them. Cool, we're going to die. Yeah, we're, we're all dead. <laughs> like, is there a scenario where we come out of this alive? Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe if one of them is nice and brings us back. But the, in, in writing those books, it was very clear to me. I knew where the story was going. I knew how it was going to end. And so I had to keep raising the stakes and introducing different elements of the setting and different parts of it incrementally so that once you got to understand one as normal, I could take you to the next le level and the next level. Because literally by the time you get to the sheer insanity that is the last book in that series, or at least is planned to, but hopefully we'll, we'll see after a developmental editor gets their hands on it. Um, yeah, the, the, the sheer insanity is off the rails. None of the people that baited it for me even mentioned how crazy the last book is because the first book escalates at a fairly steady rate. The second book escalates a little bit faster. Was I sent this ever? Uh, I don't think so. Can I be? <laughs> I could uh, send out some I could do another round of betas. Um, I like me got a death or three. Uh, and I love the characters in these books so much. I will say that one of the main changes that has to happen is one of the characters has to be turned into a tug waddle. I know that like right off the bat because they did not exist when I created this book in this setting and they actually make much more sense as a tug waddle. So that's going to have to happen. And I'm probably going to change up a couple of the other characters as well, but I need a developmental editor in here because book series goes off the rails in the best, hopefully kinds of ways, but you need to lay out the steps. You need to see the steps. And if you don't in the initial writing, you need to figure that out for one of your earliest developmental edits to get you there in a way that makes sense. My biggest, mm, my biggest critique of a writer, and I really hate to critique him because he's one of my favorite writers for this, is uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who I, I should not have to read your 200,000 word side project to understand why all of a sudden Gandalf can do the things that he does. What? Why Gandalf not dead now? he's technically an immortal being from this primordial space time that can't really die. Like every time his body dies, he just kind of gets sent back to the OG universe and then gets sent back into ours, but not all of him comes back, which is why his memory is a little shaky. I shouldn't have to read an entire side project to understand a major plot point in your book. And I feel like this is a big problem with a lot of the things that people have questions for, for the Lord of the Rings is he spent so much time explaining the lore 
except for the lord that actually impacts the story he's really light on what 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 is a balrog did you know that balrogs and gandalf are basically the same thing except for one went to the dark side and the other went to the light yeah and to quote the rb we don't need the backstory on every single tree branch but it would be nice to have some of the backstory for there because Gandalf can just wizard did it his way through every problem they get to until that one. Why? Because he actually meets his match. He meets in a in literal equal. And that's what makes the Balrog scary because Gandalf is super, super powerful. The Balrog is as powerful as he is. Is this explained in narrative? No. Nope. We, we don't get this in narrative. So people don't understand why that happens. And it brings quite a few people out of the story. The same thing with everyone asking that question that makes me so mad. Why don't they just ride the the eagles to Mordor? Because the eagles aren't really eagles. They're actually beings a lot like Gandalf. And like, remember that scene with Galadriel? Imagine that, but with an angry, angry eagle god thing that can throw lightning from its wings. And Galadriel's like, I would be terrible if I had this ring. Yeah, imagine that, except for it's an eagle that can, like, cause lightning to strike anywhere it wants to with its wings already. And now it has the ring. <laughs> this is bad. This is bad. You don't No, You can't do this. This is actually why the hobbits are chosen, because they have no power. The ring actually feeds off of power. They are the weakest species in the setting. Therefore, it can't really tempt them that badly. It's fine. It just turns it's- them into a golem. Is this explained in the text? Not really. Which is why it is, if I see one more video, just seriously, people, it's been answered like a thousand times. You don't need to make a video for your channel of why didn't they just ride the eagles? Like, mm. My family sent a video around like two days ago that was an interview with Tolkien, like an audio clip. And uh, he's like, I got a letter from a fan asking why they didn't ride the eagles to Mordor. I get asked this question a lot. And this is my answer. The answer I told him. And I will tell you now. Shut up. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Don't that, sounds, that sounds like him. That, that sounds like him a lot. Yeah, if, if you've never seen an interview with Tolkien, there are, quite a, there are several that do exist. And he's like that grandpa who's just done. Like, if you've ever, like, been over with all the cousins over at your grandparents' house to the point where your grandfather is just like, I am done with all of you, but I'm still trying to be somewhat genial. That is Tolkien's default. Like, that's where he starts all of the interviews from, of just, yes, your sister's been a pain all day. I suppose you have questions too. And I kind of I love, like, defeated grandpa energy. <laughs> it's just... It's kind, of, it's kind of a life affirming. But yeah, build it up. Make sure that you're explaining all of this. Make sure that you're putting it in there so that when all of a sudden these things happen, you know, like in The Hobbit, for example, because Tolkien is so bad about this. If we had had earlier setups that say trolls turn into stone in the sunlight, then when... Bilbo is faced with the tr- with the trolls. Our question is, how is he going to wait them out till sunlight? There's our tension. That's what's holding us through. And it doesn't feel as deus ex machina that, ha ha, the sun rose. Ha ha, you're stone now. Ha ha. It, it just, it feels like it comes out of nowhere and breaks the illusion. <laughs> right. Runs to the laptop to type at Nora's Tolkien story. Appreciated. <laughs> yes. All righty. Um, we are going to come back to this topic. But again, like I said, I want to try to get some sprints into this stream. So we are, like I forewarned, going to be doing one of those in the middle. So. Where's the button? There's the button. Let us say goodbye to Purdy Purdy Princess number three. Goodbye, Purdy Purdy Princess number three. Whoop. I'm sticking with Princess number five because, again, I want the hair.
<laughs> and everyone else has been. I play directed. blue dress, so I get one and four. I had to check real quick. I was like, did I just lose internet? It's like everything's suddenly so quiet. Alrighty. Make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Make sure that you are saving your work because I, I will state, state it early and often. The gremlins are out there and they want all of it. Save your work, back it up, send it to a friend. Make sure that you have something to hydrate with. If you have not gotten up and moved around the entire time and we have been here together, maybe do that. It would probably be good for you unless you need to rest. Then uh, don't do that. We are going to get started on this sprint in a five, four, three, two, one, and go. Let's catch ourselves a unicorn.
Number six one. I said that, but it didn't take the new <laughs> mute. My mute was not on mute. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm making cottagecore lesbians and Sims. I'm here for I'm, it. I'm surprised I haven't done this before now, considering the cottage living pack. Everyone's like, it's cottagecore lesbians. And it's just like, I haven't done this yet. But I also have that mod now that means that they can get artificially inseminated. So Glory stopped by to say hello and drop a like, and she's going to be taking a break to get ready for her stream over on Twitch later this evening. Hope everything is going well there. Uh, I love the double dipping. It's it's purple. It's mine. I, I just all the purple. Alrighty. So how did everybody do? I spent most of that sprint doing more uh, pain mitigation because is life. And wrote one long term goal down. Have rough idea of a second one. The, the examples show at least two for each, so that's what I'm trying to do is have at least two for each, because imagining the future is hard. I've been slowly making my way through this um, D&D streaming series. Um, it's called The Black Dice Society, and it's a horror story. And I'm not usually into to horror, but this cast is really entertaining. <laughs> I so need you to play the old gods of Appalachia with me when I finally get it. <laughs> I'm not saying I will convert you to being into horror, but we need somebody that will scream at the jump scares. <laughs> Hi, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> Just, just, you know, just saying. Just, just saying. Joe has a list of movies that he wants me to, that since we were dating, he's wanted me to watch just for the sheer pleasure of watching me watch them like this. <laughs> I have such a weird relationship with horror films. It, it's... I can watch a Halloween movie and not have a problem in the world, but like get out in those movies just like I have nightmares for weeks we were watching this one a few weeks ago on it was on TV um, it was something love and monsters um, my brain is not doing names today I know what you're I, I, I know what you're talking about I just it's not yeah and it did have an interesting story and there were some parts because neither of us had ever seen it because if Joe has seen a movie he's he and he knows the gross parts he is at least nice enough to go cover your eyes <laughs> um but there were a couple times because it was the first time seeing it that we both went Ew! but um <laughs> it was an interesting story and they had I borrowed this creature for my plot bunny series because they had floating jellyfish. They called them sky jellies and they were the coolest things in the world. I'm like, I want in my story. <laughs> I, I, I'm marginally excited for season two of, I always get these in, in the wrong order and I am sorry for that ahead of time. Love, sex, death, and robots. I think it's the name of the show. It's those words in an order. I know love is the first one. I it's, it's on Netflix. Uh, it, it is a series that goes from pretty much all the genres. They've done a couple horror episodes that were really, really good. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to continue some of the stories that we started in the previous one and not have it all just be original shorts, though I would not mind for some of it. But I, I rather enjoyed the first one. It was an interesting experience. Okay, I 
found it. It's a 2020 movie, so it must have come out just before the Panini. I put the... Did I freeze or did Carrie freeze? Okay. <laughs> that really scared me because Kat's muted. And <laughs> I'm Sorry. like, now I see Kat's mouth moving and I hear no sounds. Who broke? Was it me? Was it her? Who broke? Somebody broke. Ah, Loving Monsters. Yeah, I have to check this out. I'm I'm back. My as soon as I hit send that my connection went Alrighty. So where were we? I love my brain. We are friends. We're very good friends. So we have talked about internal consistency. We've talked about establishing the ordinary. We've talked about having the courage of your convictions when you're writing. And we're about to double down on that one. We've talked about boiling the frog, having the build up. But you know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you just need to go for it and uh, just ride the leopard. Just, just jump on its back. It, it, It might eat you. It might be an epic ride. You don't know. So I do have, I, th- I think I have a question for like the fourth one. Okay. Um. So like, or maybe I'm just wanting to see if I'm doing this right or how, if I, I plan to do this right. Um. So Lavinia, um, I think I've mentioned like, cause shadow travel is a thing in um, shadow. Um. And it's actually an extremely hard thing to do. And Lavinia becomes really adept at it by the end of the series. So, like, I, I'm, like, towards the end of book one and in book two, she's, like, learning how to do shadow travel. And then eventually she actually, I want her to create her own little pocket dimension where she just stores things and her hand will just, vroom, vroom, like, where, where did you get the... Maybe we all learn that power. Where'd you get the sword? So like my pocket. I would love to have that power. Anyway. Mm. Um and because she also in her mastering of shadow travel um ends up actually doing like the impossible on accident with it because people will just disappear. Like, you accidentally opened a portal, but you didn't open a portal on the other side. And the person is just gone. Forever. Like, we have no idea how to get these people back. They're just dead. Um, And she actually, in her studying of shadow travel, actually finds someone who is very important. And there's a reason she was specifically able to get accidentally from them. So, to, like... So you're asking, how do you set, set up a, an impossible surprise? Well, because that impossible surprise happens in the middle of the series. <clears throat> so and she's the, like, I'm not supposed to be able to do that, right? So there are a couple fun, fun ways to do this. The first one is using some version of, che- of Chekhov's gun. I, I forgot what it's called. There's actually a name for this partic- particular variant where... You are putting a literal impossibility on the table. This can never happen. This can never happen. This can never happen. Oh, oh crap. It just happened. And the way to do that is to hammer home both before the event, the impossibility of it, and post the event, some preferably not hand wavium or balonium, because we... we, I think most of us are tired of the hand wavium. Um, <laughs> just meh, wizard did it. So, some explanation for how that actually isn't the answer. Now there are several ways to do this badly. There is a horrifically horrible, bad, terrible episode of Star Trek Voyager. I believe it's titled Evolution, 
It's in the either the sixth or seventh season of the show where it's impossible to go warp 10. If you go warp 10, you will be all places everywhere. And then because he is Tom Paris and he zoom zoom fly fast, he he break warp 10 and then become weird fish person. And then him kidnap Janeway, make her into weird fish person. And then they start a new civilization on another planet. And then they get made into not fish people anymore because everything's fine now. And that's why we don't go faster than warp 10. So I bring this up because having an unintended consequence can be a very good way to say why this is impossible, that there is a cost or a price that is paid. I bring up the that particular episode as the please, please make it one that makes sense. Consequence, because oops, we accidentally became fish people and made new civilization. Oopsie is we why? Can I have it be like something is like somehow like celestial things like magic things like happened correctly and then because spoiler this person is biologically related to her so she and she is the basically the only person related to them left in a way like weird magic woohoo thingies happen and she's accident like i i was just practicing where did you come from there, there, there wasn't supposed to be another side to this portal. So one way that you can pull that off is through the magic plot point MacGuffin thingy that doesn't seem to matter until it actually does. Uh, one of my favorite shows on TV right now, uh, Motherland Fort Salem. Yay, I got a name out of my head. Um, does this where we are introduced to the um, mycelium early in the series. It's, it's this weird mushroom wall that just happens to be there that is, according to the rule of three, mentioned several times before it starts to matter. It's because of the weird relationship that Raelle develops with weird mushroom wall that she can do things that are impossible. And when I say impossible, magic in the setting has a cost. But most basic magic, the cost is so small, nobody notices. Like if you were sitting at a coffee shop using magic to stir your tea, like the cost to that is so small, like maybe your hair gets a little brittle or something like it, it would be so minuscule that like you would, you know, you wouldn't notice. But no if, yeah, if you're doing like big war magic where you're like throwing uh, sky kaiju at each other that will cause famines somewhere because you're taking the vital energy out of the universe and focusing it here, which means it's not going to be somewhere else. That weather will not happen elsewhere. So they're inadvertently causing famines as a result of war. Healing magic, the person who is doing the healing takes on a lesser version of the affliction that they are healing. Then Rael almost brings somebody back from the dead. By accident. Oops. And she gets really, really close. And this should not be a thing that can happen. This is the first thing that we see her do. That is just, wait, wait, what now? And because I don't want to give spoilers for that show because everybody should be watching it. It's so good. There's only one more season of it. They're short seasons. They're like 12 episodes each. Season one and two are out. Season three starts in June. Get caught up so we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> but all of the weird things that she's able to do is connected to her, her relationship to the mycelium. And in season two, where we get the reveal of what the mycelium actually is. Because is not just a mushroom. I mean, that should be a duh, but you know, modern fiction, you never know. Um, but when you actually get the reveal for what it is. Oh, wait. Oh. 
And suddenly what happens is a lot of things click into place. So Parla Hamplow in Star Wars, I'm trying to use examples that are readily accessible to people. Uh, Mother Townsend is the head of the Night Sisters and has just inordinate power. Like when she meets Darth Maul, he has weird robot legs that don't function right. And she literally waves her hand and through the force rebuilds his robot legs in front of him. Just like extreme power. And it's just like, okay, I guess she's just super strong. Later in series, you learn that, no, the reason she's Mother Townsend is she has access to the force energy of every dead night sister that has ever existed. Damn. Everyone that has ever come before her, which is why if you listen to her talk, you can hear other voices behind hers. There's a, from the first time you meet her, there's this strange echo effect on her voice that you just kind of assume, well, I guess that's how they're setting her off is like, she's powerful. She's no, no. You're hearing the voices of all of the other sisters speaking through her as she starts using the magic their voices get louder to the point where she sounds almost like a chorus because she is a chorus this isn't explained until much later in series right but the explanation is there and it was there from the very beginning like the first time we meet her and she does like some crazy powerful magic it's just like, okay, I guess she's just super powerful for switch. First force switch we're meeting. I don't know what their power levels are. I guess she's just OP. Got it. And then when you find out how and why, which by the way, uh, JJ Abrams stole that explanation from her and gave it to Palpatine for uh, rise of Skywalker. <laughs> That's how Palpatine is as powerful as he is. Uh, because he did not have any original ideas for that movie. Just, anyway. Um, so by seeding, seeding this little explanation early, because we don't need to know that she has this power until basically the Empire decides to genocide her homeworld. And she just wakes up all the dead sisters. Good for her. Like, no, 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 no. We're not putting up with this crap. And wakes up all of them. And af as after that point, you notice her voice is now thin. That echo effect is not as pronounced as it was. Because all of that energy has been put back into all of the zombie <laughs> night sisters that are running around. You see what I'm saying? It was this subtle little thing that you didn't really pay attention to earlier. That when she does the super impossible thing. It's like, oh... And I can't remember if that's the character or not, but isn't she the character that like uh, has like a glyph appear on all the people she turns or is that a different character or did you change that? Oh, so the, so Lavinia is the witch. Dinah is the vampire. Okay. So Dinah is the one with the, the, the symbol um, that she, they, that her bloodline, you're awesome blood. Um, and they actually absorb. <laughs> So you could set that up earlier by having her do something that seems a little OP and a little strange. So I do have Lavinia do a scene at the very beginning, like the first or second chapter, which appar I apparently didn't put in the Kindlella. And I was so pissed at myself that I did that because it's a scene where she she's taught. She doesn't know she's doing it the whole time um, because she's talking to her friend and she, her she's losing control of her powers, and she actually kills the entire guard. Mm. Like everything just looks burnt and dead when she walks away, and she doesn't like. And it's nighttime, and she, so she one doesn't know this, so she can't really see it. Two, like she's so emotional that she doesn't even realize what she's doing, and her because like her brother, like the next day is like, so what happened to the guard? Don't worry, I fixed it, but what happened? So, yeah, so as long as you're setting it up, there there are 
all of the things that Wanda Maximoff is reputed to have done in uh, uh, Multiverse of Madness, which again, sorry, I have not seen, but that she also did in WandaVision is set up in her very first appearance where she's able to trick everyone with this illusion. Like the very first time we see her, we see this little bitty taste of what she's capable of doing. So the fact that she's able to create this grand delusion bubble and warp reality in WandaVision is set set up. And as long as you're doing those little, little setups, you can help explain it. In uh, Crucify, which is the first book in the seri- series that I've been g- talking about here, um, our character is shown healing a sick girl and immediately like collapsing on the ground and is cradled in the arms of Sister Death. Like one of the death gods is literally there just like stroking his hair out of his face and just soothing him because it's not his time yet. You have so many things that I need you to do. So many things. And as far as he knows, she kept keeps him alive as a healer because disease is life run amok and his job is to kill it that's what he thinks is his purpose and that's how we meet him but this is our initial setup for all of the wacky crazy things that will follow and it's actually one of my favorite scenes in the book but i hope that answers the question at least a little bit um let's see where did I see it? There's been some chat in chat. Um, let's see. There it is. Uh, ah, I completely lost my place. I scrolled back way too far. So I'm just going to do this one. Why, why couldn't Dur- uh, Dur- Darth Maul have those legs when he faced Obi-Wan? Uh, Darth Maul is my favorite Sith Lord in the entire series. And... I w- do not regret that at all. I he he is my favorite from the first time he fought Obi Wan to the last time he fought Obi Wan, which is one of the most beautiful things that has ever been put in a Star Wars story. And everything that happened in between, he is one of my favorite villains, and I love him so so much. So, number five, which I lovingly titled Ride the Leopard, just go for it. Uh, Ride the Leopard is a reference to the cult of Dionysus, where you have to choose to either ride to ride the leopard every day of your life. Sure, the re- leopard might eat you, but if it doesn't, it's going to be one hell of a ride. And this was the analogy that they used for the life force flowing through all of us. And we were talking before the show started This is, this is the, oh my goodness, the thing that I love so much about anime and manga and what I think a lot of people love about it too, is there's not a lot of hand wringing over why magic bullets go pew pew, magic bullets go pew pew. Like it's just, it's, it's what, it's what they do. Like we never find out why there is a death note or have long protracted discussions about the ethics of should there be death notes because the Shinigami don't care. They just want to kill things. Let me kill things. I hear for things be dead. They don't care. And it just goes there. And I know somebody's going to say in the comments that like Kira has these questions and stuff and yes he does and then gets over them really quickly when he's just like i can make the bad people go die die (laughs) and eats chips dramatically while writing in a journal and i can't breathe because it's so dramatic Mm -hmm. sorry i love the death note it's so good (laughs) good night cb but this is the this is the thing that makes anime and manga have a very special feel to it is unlike Western fantasy, it does not bother itself with a lot of the hand wringing. It just says, go with it. Just, just go with it. Trust me. We're in for a ride. Just, just buckle in. We're going now. Just, we're going to go. 
get get in here. And sometimes that's the right choice for you. And yes, I still think the earlier things that we talked about still apply. You should still be making sure that you're doing your setups and doing them well. You should be working on your internal consistency because God help you. I have noped out of so many manga and anime series because they suddenly decided, actually, everything's going to work this other way now because we got bored. And like everything that I invest in my interest into is no longer true. And just why am I here then? Just, just why? But having the courage to just right from the get go, run for it. And this to me is the popularity of Star Wars. Star Wars was one of the first major Western fantasy stories, and it is a fantasy story set in space. It is not a science fiction story that just, is there some hand wavium over what the force is? Yeah. He, Obi-Wan kind of talks about it, but what is the force? Force's power makes space wizards go pew pew. Like that's, that's what the force is. That's all you need to know. There's no hand wringing about it. There's no long detailed explanations about it. What, why are the droids important? Because reasons. What terrible things have the empire done to justify them being overthrown? Trust us. They were bad. It's fine. Just go with it. Empire bad. Just say it with me now. Empire bad. Rebels good. Let's just go. Let's just go. And that is in contrast to the original scripts for this, where the movie that was actually shot includes a scene, which if you want us to hear it wonderfully uh, brought to life, it there, the uh, part of the clip has been released as a uh, uh, deleted scene and is over on Disney plus, but in the PBS anime um, P- PBS full cast audio dramatization of star Wars, they worked off of the shooting script rather than the script movie that actually got edited together and made it out script. And it stars Mark Hamill, by the way, the only member of the original cast that makes a reprise of his role in this is Mark Hamill. Um, And the guy that they got to play Han Solo is hilarious and wrong and not the person who should have ever had that part. And I kind of love it for that, but (laughs) (laughs) it actually includes this very early scene fully acted out where Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker actually goes to Tashi Station and sits down with Biggs Darklighter, who in the version we have of the movie, he doesn't meet until he gets to the Rebel base and is about to go fight the Death Star. Nope, he was at the very beginning of the movie. And uh, they sit down and literally talk about how bad the Empire is for like five and a half minutes. Biggs, Luke, and two of their friends who, by the way, make a super secret cameo in The Mandalorian. And I absolutely love that. (laughs) They're not even like called out that episode. I'm sorry, it's not about The Mandalorian. It's in the book of Boba Fett. When Boba Fett goes to take down the biker gang and there's those two people having a debate at the at the bar when he walks before he walks in and he walks in and everything goes crazy. Those are two of Luke's friends that were originally in (laughs) A new hope that they brought the actor, they brought in new actors and made them look just like they did in the original, put them in the same place. And they're still having the same argument they were having in the original deleted scene, which is hilarious because everybody moved on with their life except for them. Literally, they're still at that same bar, still having the same argument, and it's precious. But when everybody was shown this movie, they were like, why is there this long protracted explanation about galactic politics here? Why, why is this a thing? Why? And uh, Marsha and a couple other very ingenious editors who snuck around behind everyone's back and re-edited the damn thing, cut it out. All we get is a brief thing. Text scrolls, empire bad, empire about to do really bad. Meet our heroes. <laughs> and we rush right into it. And that was the magic that got people in. And you can see how this fell apart for all of the knockoff Star Wars that happened. Uh, Battlestar Galactica gives us a very protracted explanation of who the Cylons are, 
what's going on with the war? Why are we in this predicament? Why, who are all of the key players? Do I care anymore? Was that Ernest Borgnine? No, it was that other actor whose name I can never remember. Okay. <sighs> and then you're tired. And then the show actually starts. Because <laughs> if you've never seen the original Battlestar Galactica, I'm not talking about the like reboot that the Sci-Fi Channel did. I'm talking about the like 1980s original Battlestar Galactica. And not, Battle, not Battlestar Galactica in 1980. That's the sequel series. <laughs> The original, where, yeah, it's just, uh, okay, all right. And they've been fighting forever because, okay, okay, and the tribes, each, okay, each tribe has its own issue, okay, and, oh, we're naming the tribes now. Okay, how many of them? There are 12. There, there are 12? Okay, there are 12. Okay, and, oh, we, we are actually going through all 12. All of, okay. And how many of them are still alive by the time our story starts? One. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling me about the other 11 that will not factor into the story at all, I guess. Can we get to spaceships go pew pew? Like, please. And that's why it doesn't work. That's why that series did not get the traction that they wanted. That in the lawsuit, because they may have ripped off a lot of show ships from Star Wars, but that's a whole other, other thing. Um, <laughs> There may be X-Wings in that original Battlestar Galactica <laughs> miniseries, <laughs> among other ships that will look very familiar if you've seen the Star Wars movies. But yeah, they just got into it. Marvel did this too. There's not a lot of hand-wringing about should there be superheroes. We meet Tony Stark sitting in a, sitting in a limousine. Limousine goes boom, boom. Something bad happened. Flashback to how he got into Limousine, where we get to know a little bit something about him as a character and realize you're a not a nice guy and I don't really like you. Why are you a superhero? Then everything goes boom, boom. And we see, oh, you actually kind of have a moral center. You've just been covering it up because capitalism. OK. Um, and then you kind of like him. Capitalism and daddy issues. Capitalism and daddy issues. <laughs> the raison d'etre of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, so many daddy issues for so few movies. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. You could name the daddy issues that almost every character. Mommy issues. A couple mommy issues. A lot of daddy issues, though. So many daddy issues. Uh, anywho, but we just get get to it. We don't do that that much in Western fiction. We have to have the protracted excuse. The long explanation. Sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes you need to just have the courage of your convictions and just jump in it. Maybe explain some afterwards. I know we like to make fun of Dragon Ball Z because, oh, there's so much to make fun of. But at least it kind of pays lip service to what power levels are and how they're developed in protracted episodes that are just a loop of Goku running for an entire episode. Yeah. He's still running. He's, he's it's still that same loop. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, wow, this must've been cheap to produce anyway, um, <laughs> but at least it kind of explains, it kind of tells us eh, this is who Shinran is, but you know, it doesn't really matter because big space dragon make wish go boom. That's all you really need to know. That's all, all that needs to be there. And we move on. The same thing is true with Full Metal Alchemist, and I kind of wish that Laura was still here to gush about this because she likes that series a lot more than I do. But when we meet the Elric brothers, one of them is a giant hollow suit of armor, but sounds like a child. And do you really take time to explain it? Just, just, just go with it. Just, it's fine. It's fine. It's, something bad happened, and that. We're trying to fix that. Can we just move on with the story? Like, it's it's not even hand-waved. It's just, that's who he is. This is my brother. He's a giant metal suit of armor and sounds like a child. It's fine. Can I have my thing now? And it go, goes on. The sci-fi series that I'm currently working on, I am desperately trying to make that a thing. 
and we will see how well I can pull this one off. This is the one I'm most fascinated by because it's the one that I really haven't done. I tend to be a boil the frog writer where I start very, very simple and very like, it's just the way that, you know, so just we're going to introduce one weird thing and then build from there. The current sci-fi series that I'm working on, I'm not really doing that. And I'm hoping to not overwhelm people. I'm hoping that I'm at least while we're starting in media res, while we're starting in the middle of the, what could be a very protracted argument about why there are two bad guys that want people for reasons and things and why a crystal matters and all this other, like, like it'll make sense later. Just trust me. It'll make sense. We'll, we'll get there because it's not important at the beginning at all. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. It's the difference between why, why an adult work. Because sometimes it's important to lay those foundations, but so many books I have in a, I have just put over in my DNF pile. Because if your book starts with a prologue that is the 6,000 year history of your setting, you're not actually adding to the realism of your story. You're, you're giving me an article that should be on your world anvil. That's linked to, if I want to go back and read it, <laughs> like that's, that's what that is. And a lot of stories still, still start that way. And like, please just, just don't just, just, just maybe don't. So those, those are the five main ways that I thought of for how to build this realism. in. I think the biggest one though, is what we talked about at the very beginning is understanding what we mean by realism, because realism is built more on the emotions that the characters have and their experience of the setting being relatable. Even if the events are not relatable, I will never in my life experience anything like either of the Elric brothers does in Full Metal Alchemist. I hope, dear God, please wear some wood to knock on. Hey, eh, close enough. Oh, eat your wood. Because, um, you know, hopefully I won't end up being chased by like human sized homo you know, homunculi that are just out to destroy me because evil in the universe. Hopefully I will never experience that, but I can relate to the emotions that they're going through. Let's see, Bri Bri Brianna says adults should need less hand holding. Yes. And tro tropes, they, um, they can fo follow what's going on. Yes. With less explanation. And I see, see so many younger people who feel the need to ba back, back and explain everything. Right. Um, and I think adult fiction is being more and more de demonized for not giving so much handholding. It, it is. And see, to me, the biggest difference here is not so much in how much handholding there is. It's in the things that we've talked about before. I don't feel like a Song of Ice and Fire is a consistent world, for example. What pulled me out of those books and why I did not continue reading the series is the inconsistency of the magic of the magic in there that made me feel like magic does whatever Gerd needs it to do at any given time in the story. And that's it. Like that that is the magic system is Gerd needs magic to do this. And so magic do that now. And that is worse than a wizard did it in my book. And he may have it all worked out. I'm not saying that he doesn't. I just did not find it in the text. And that to me is not handholding. That is helping me understand that there is something consistent in the way that you're de developing your setting and your world. Um, this is the biggest problem, of course, with how the series, the TV series Game of Thrones ended is all the characters suddenly became inconsistent AF. And... <laughs> Like, I finally found a new love that is not my sister. I love you, Brianna. I love you. I'm going to go back to my sister now. Bye. <laughs> like, what? This, this entire plot arc is one episode. Like, so you got over her. 
you're fine. You have a new love. You've, you've, you've consummated your new love. And now, hey, eh, I'm going to go back to my sister. Like, just that's a lot for one. That's a lot for one episode. That, that's a lot for one episode. Just way, way too much. <laughs> yes. One, one of the re- many reasons the one host on um, the writing about dragons and sh- podcast um, in every single episode, he finds a reason to say, George R. R. Martin is dead to me because. <laughs> now, he's used mainly going off of the books and he always talks about like the the first three are great, four five, six and seven will probably never happen. So to kind of hammer this home, uh, well, I don't agree with all the aesthetic choices that he made. Uh, Gene Roddenberry, when he was making Star Trek, refused to let them include Inhuman Aliens. Because he said with the types of stories we're telling, the audience needs to see the eyes of the actor to relate to them and to carry the emotion through. Because that's that's how we make it to the end of our story is that connection in that story. And while I don't believe that they necessarily have to be human shaped, because even in the original series, you have uh, the Bortas is just it, it's a little pillow cushion that goes on the on the ground and like kills people but um it, it is my heart <laughs> like it is my heart because it's just trying to protect its babies and so i i don't think you have to have a human face but i think the better answer to that is what jim henson said is that in all of your fiction you have to work in handles there has to be something that your audience can grab onto and go oh i know where i am i can orient myself into the setting now And he always felt that that was the difference between his uh, movie, The Dark Crystal, and his movie, The um, The Labyrinth. Labyrinth gave us something to hold on to. We had characters that we could relate to in a way that we did not in The Dark Crystal. And finding those things that you can make relatable are so important. When I think of relatable characters and I go to a show like Farscape, for example, which is predominantly filled with wonderful uh, Henson puppets. Those characters are immensely relatable, whether they look like humans or not, because they have emotions I can relate to. They have story arcs that I can feel. And that, more than anything, is what makes the story relatable. If if the story... If the story is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and it's just one inexplicable event after another, and then you go home because quest done, what 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 is the point of that? What what am I supposed to get out of that? When I read Mallory's version of this, and I see him really afraid for his life, like I'm going to have to go there and let him cut my head off because I accidentally promised. Oops. There's a sense of terror there. There's a sense of fear there that I can hold on to, even though we're dealing with this weird fantasy creature that's intruding into what is predominantly not that kind of a setting. And yeah, I really agree. He is trying really hard not to be Tolkien. And it has hurt his fiction a lot in that he has used realism as a cudgel to justify the rank misogyny and homophobia that exists in his setting because historically accurate and George, no, because Westeros isn't real. Westeros is made up and can be whatever you want it to be. In fact, if you want to completely throw that out of a real world setting and still tell a good story, watch uh, our flag means death would people be that okay with uh, gay pirate pirates maybe i don't know i wasn't a pirate in the 17 in the 1700s but you know what is good story is relatable characters i can connect with this i'm willing to go with it because you know you're telling a good story uh 
So you actually agree with the idea of not, not featuring a featuring non-humanoid and not non-human based organisms or planet. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's so many interesting things that we can do. Um, and so, so many fun ways that you can tell a story. One of my favorite scenes in a forthcoming book of mine is from the perspective of a living ship that is a POV character in the story. And so this ship knows everything that's going on inside. All, all of the things that all the people are doing. And it was so much fun to write, but also really... That poor ship. But really technically difficult, because how do I make essentially the god of this world relatable? Right, because while the ship's not like super powered like a deity, like if she decides to turn off the air, everybody die. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like she she gets frustrated and turns the air and water off. Everybody dead. So I mean, for all intents and purposes, god of this world, right? Ah, oh, yes. And so yeah, I went back and I reread the ship who sang and uh, uh, all the. Names and I are not getting along today. But yeah, I went back and I reread those books. And oh my goodness, they're so good. I have not actually read that. I'm going to have to check that out. So the Living Ship series by Robin Hobb. I will definitely have to check that out. But I, I went back and read stuff that I liked. I thought a lot about it. I had a lot of fun writing in... Uh, what is essentially first person omniscient for those scenes because the ship is the eye <laughs> and uh, it, it, it allowed for some interesting, interesting choices. And again, hopefully it will survive the editorial process, but it was a lot of fun to do. And the trickiest part, again, to make it feel real was giving a sense of purpose, giving a sense of connection so that the, the character of the ship was relatable. Okay. Do, do, do not read. All right. I, I will have, I'll definitely have to check those out. I love getting good book recommendations. So we're almost up at the end of our stream. Does anybody have any questions or other comments for this? So Brianna says, my my book features dra dragons, and it was dra dragons who created most of the human human bay, um, most of what humans base their culture on. So humans are having the spe um, species wide culture shock, trying to figure out who they are apart from the dragons. That is interesting. That is a really interesting idea. Um. I do not recommend this book lightly in that one, it's a book that is used as a college textbook. So is not cheap. Um, and two is book that is used as a college textbook. So is not simply written. Um, but I would, if you can get a copy of it, uh, who wrote it? It's called the myth of disenchantment is the name of the book. And let me, let me pull it up real quick and see who wrote it. Cause my brain is not good with names. Uh, it is the myth of D disenchantment by, uh, G Jason Josephson by Joseph, a jo Josephson storm. So, um, it is a really interesting book in that it is, a sociological look at the enlightenment to from the enlightenment to the modern day and basically how things have changed since we have uh, dropped a lot of previous mythologies in some ways and adopted new ones in other ways. It's a really interesting book about a culture going through a quasi demythologizing of itself 
it, it's 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 a really interesting book, but it's 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 an academic text, and it's not like it's hard to read. It's just dense, and uh, not that not not excuse me, not that cheap because it's from a college press. But if that's something that you can get your hands on, might help, might be an interesting research for something like that. Yeah. What is the meaning of life? 42. Everybody knows that. Meaning of life is 42. And uh, the question... And the question, of course, that that goes to, if you pay attention to the text, is how many, man, how many roads was man walked down before you can call him a man? And the answer is 42. That's... If you actually read the text, that that, and they even included that in the movie. If you pay very, very close, that's actually the question that is answered by the number forty-two. <laughs> so, I, I do too. I, I read quite a few myself, and sorry, I am looking over at my stack of course books that are sitting right next to me as I am writing my final paper for the class I'm currently taking. Um, <laughs> I'm just like some of those I enjoyed reading others others there on the stack all righty it is just about time for us to go does anybody have anything that they want to say before we head off uh, I have a video coming out on Friday I reveal the cover for volume one of misadventures of a mom author that i'm compiling the first 50 episodes that are up on kindle vela into a book and that'll be out uh i also say when the release date is too in the video so i won't spoil it <laughs> that is such a hard thing to do because as i'm in parallel to the class work working on super secret master project number one all I want to do is be talking super about your secret it. master project. That's super different from super secret project. Yes. I, part, part of the uh, sage seminar that I was in, I figured out the one project to rule them all. Hmm. I found the master <laughs> key that I've been looking for for years. And it's all I want to talk about. It is all I want to talk about, but it has to be released in stages. It's, it's, oh, uh. well, so it, and it's you know only two days from now, so <laughs> I, I I can keep my mouth shut for that long. I think oh, maybe. Oh. Yeah, the, people may not start seeing the fruits of Super Secret Master Project Number One until for like maybe two three months. So I'm gonna have to find a way to shut up for that long. So I'll be going on hiatus now. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> but maybe. Um, all right have the fun i hope that you are doing okay we do have the link to my discord should be in the thing below unless it got weird again because youtube has been changing the the doobly-doo when i do it to an old version of the default one and i don't know why it's doing that and it's getting really frustrating because I changed my default one and I'm putting in a completely different one and it keeps reverting to the old default one. And I just, I don't, I don't understand what's going on with YouTube. I don't understand it, but hopefully my discord is linked below. And uh, yeah, we do this on Wednesdays. So next week we will be discussing how to do world building for the real world, which is a topic that was asked for by our own Megan McCarthy. And a topic that I don't think it's enough talking about because when we talk about world building, it's usually for fantasy and science fiction. But if you're not doing world building for your literary fiction or real world, fic, uh, it's going to feel a little thin. So we'll be talking about that next week. Next month, we're going to be doing a little bit of a pivot where I'm not going to be doing as much of this kind of presenting on the on the stream it's still going to be over here on youtube but i'm going to be doing prep for uh su summer camp this year i'm hoping to do both both a world building summer camp project and maybe a camp nano summer project at the same time which is famous last words um but i need to start prepping so that i am ready for all of that 
So we are going to be shifting over to doing that starting next month. So, so that'll be back into writing sprints. It'll be back into writing sprints and probably depending on how things are going, maybe even fairly militant, uh, almost Pomodoro quick, quick runs, because I have so much that I need to have set up before that all gets together. Because super secret master project number one bows to no one. Yeah, I'll, I'll be spending most of June editing and working with my friend who's line editing um, my contemporary fantasy. So, yay! <laughs> so tomorrow we will be streaming over on Twitch. We will be doing Valheim again. According to Brian, we are going to be fighting Elder at some point. I don't know if they're going to do that before or after I get out of class, but <laughs> that will be happening tomorrow over on Twitch. And then Friday, I don't know. Y'all kind of enjoyed uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Maybe I will start do a restart of that game and play all the way through on stream for you if you want, or we can pick a different game or something, but it'll probably be a game stream because my brain is toasty and I am writing a final right now. <laughs> my brain is toasty. All right. Thank you all for being here. And as always, remember, Black Lives Matter, Black Trans Lives Matter, and trans identities are kind of magical. Uh, until next time, remember to ride your dreams into reality, and don't forget to have the fun. Bye!